Okay. So before I do my talk today, I want to mention this. It's called Sitting Together. And this is the Adult Study Guide. It's right here, Adult Study Guide, a family-centered curriculum on mindfulness, meditation, and Buddhist teachings. So this is what the adults read, mom and dad. Then we had the children's lesson plans to teach the children all about Buddhism and meditation. And then we have the activity book for children. And I have something I did in this activity book. They published my song, the Five Precept Song, that they use in Anaheim. Anaheim Buddhist Vihara, they have taught the children the Five Precept Song so they too can practice the precepts. And so this comes as a package, three. I think they're on special uh, for August at 35 bucks, and then it goes up to like $60. But if you, if you want to teach young people Buddhism, mindfulness, and meditation, this is a good place to start. just came out last month in June. Huh? Uh, a woman by the name of Sumi Loudon Kim. She teaches and is a minister at a university. I forget the university. It might be Columbia or something. She, she's written a few books on Buddhism. And this is something that she wanted to do and was able to complete. So it's really a, you can find it on Amazon. It's really an amazing uh, project that she completed. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about freedom. And if we talked about freedom from heat, we could talk about the air conditioner. But I'm going to talk about freedom in the bigger sense of what it means to be free as a Buddhist. So there's an evolutionary process that goes on, I think, and when we start to think about what freedom is to us. In the beginning, freedom for me was to get out of school. I said to myself, if I can get out of school, I'll be free. Uh, five days a week, homework, sometimes the weekends were taken up. And it was just year after year after year learning all this stuff that I may or may not use. And, and there was just such pressure to get good grades, to be sociable, to join the basketball team or the football team. And just my whole life was just consumed with school. And I knew once I got out of school, I would be a free person. Well, sort of. But then... The idea after you get out of school is to leave your family because your family has kept you as a prisoner for your whole life. They gave you life. They taught you what not to do. They taught you how to speak. They taught you how to think. They taught you all these kind of things. And if you really wanted to be free, I said to myself, I need to be like the bird pushed out of the nest. And fly or not fly, I would be free on the way down. So, so I got out of school, and then my family and I decided it was time for me to go. They wanted me to be free too. <laughs> so off I went. And then I realized that in order to be free and not live at home, I needed to have a job. So then the big search went to find work. And then you realize that you're not free because you got to work. And they pay you. And the reason they pay you is because nobody wants to do <laughs> what they're paying you to do. So then I thought to myself, well, okay, I'll just work really hard. And then I'll just work my way up the corporate ladder and get into middle management. And then I'll be free. So I worked real hard. I was a salesperson for a long time, and then I went into management. And I realized that I went from hourly and commission to salary, which meant they could work me as much as they wanted and not give me any more money. 
So I ended up doing six days a week for less money than I would if I got paid by the hour. But I had a moniker, manager. And that triggered my pride. And it was okay to work six days a week and not make a lot of money because I had this illusion of being somebody. But in the illusion of being somebody, you're still not free. So at the age of 28, I found Buddhism. I started to read about Buddhism. And Buddhism is about freedom. It's all only concerned about one thing, freedom. And it's not free in doing what you want to do. It's not free in working in the job you want to work in. It's free from suffering. That's the kind of freedom Buddhism talks about. The only kind of freedom. And you can be free from suffering in anything you do if you have the right mindset. So Buddhism is designed to change the way you think about what you do and who you are. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to be free in a Buddhist way. But then somebody said to me the other day, does that mean you're free to do bad stuff as well? If you're free to do good stuff and end your suffering and be compassionate and kind, are you then still free to be a jerk and create more suffering rather than less and make everybody feel uncomfortable? Is that part of the freedom that Buddhism is talking about? Isn't that a good question now? And I had to think two days before I came up with an answer. And the answer is, no. If you're seeking Buddhist freedom, you do not have the freedom to be unskillful. That's not being free. That's being a prisoner. That's the way it normally works. You're not free because you have greed, hatred, and delusion. You have attachment and desire and craving, pushing you in a certain direction. And that certain direction is unskillful. So if you're doing something that creates more suffering, you're not doing it because you're free. You're doing it because you're a prisoner of your greed, of your hatred, and your delusion. And the idea is to wake up and free yourself from that as well as the craving and the desire and the attachment and the aversion. Okay, so, so where do we start in our road to freedom? Well, it seems to me the best place to start would be the five precepts. So you say to yourself, I want to be free from having to kill. I want to be free from having to kill. Because people that kill aren't free. They don't have a choice. I heard somebody talking about the 4th of July and how wonderful it is on Mammoth Mountain because there's snow. And people are going to be going up the mountains to go snow skiing on the 4th of July. First time it may have ever happened. Then you come down the mountain and you can go in your boat. And you can go water skiing, or you can sunbathe, or if you really want to have some fun, you can go and kill fish. Now, they didn't say kill fish. They said you can go fishing. And they had little sunglasses on and a big hat and a big fishing pole. And they were so excited about the proposition of going out to kill fish. And I thought to myself, gosh, as a Buddhist, free yourself from having to kill to make that the best day of your life. The second precept is we want to free ourselves from taking stuff, from stealing stuff that isn't ours, and we don't have permission to have it. And the more and more I watch television, the more and more I see people stealing stuff. Knock, knock, burglaries. They knock on the door, they break the door down, and they come in and steal all your stuff. So I think we should put a sign on the Buddha saying, this is fiberglass, do not steal. It's not worth anything. (laughs) But people think, ah, in the Buddhist monastery is gold and silver everywhere. Very valuable things. IBMC, no, 
<laughs> no gold and silver here. So freeing yourself from having to take stuff to make your day better. Because you think the more stuff I have, the better day I'm going to have. Freeing yourself from having to indulge in sexual misconduct. That you don't have to indulge in sexual misconduct to have a good day. And I, I keep going back to the idea that we have 7 billion people. So even with good sexual conduct, we keep having all these people. Then there'll be 8 billion people. Then there'll be 9 billion people. So everybody should come and thank that monk and that monk and that monk for not having any kids. Thank you very much. One less child in the world. More room for all of us that are already here. Now, I know it's a rather radical way to look at it, because every time I go to Food for Less, I see one woman with 12 kids, and they're buying one carton of milk. And I'm trying to push my way through the crowds to get my cat food. And I'm thinking, wow, look at all these children. And then right across the street is a, is a grade school. Hundreds and hundreds of screaming little people running back and forth, having the best time, making the most noise. You know, I'm like, wow. And then I come back to IBMC, and we have cats that make no noise at all. <laughs> we have a pleasant backyard with a koi pond. You can hear the rumbling of the water. It's wonderful. I think, how lucky am I that I don't have a lot of children, that I have no children? How lucky am I? You know, blessed. Speaking unskillfully. I want to be free from telling lies, from using harsh speech, from using malicious speech. I want to be free from all of that. That is a good kind of freedom. That every time I open my mouth, pleasantries will come out. Please and thank you. Happy to see you. Isn't it a wonderful day? Things that make life better, not worse. Things that don't undermine our reality. I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but it's hard to know who's telling the truth. You know? Fake news. I think news has always been fake. It's just now we have a name for it. And, and, and it tells us what we're supposed to think about the world around us. But if you don't watch the news for a couple of weeks and you walk outside, you, you, you're seeing something completely different. You're not seeing car chases or armed robberies or hit and runs. You're seeing a sidewalk and trees. You're seeing birds chirping. What a different way of looking at the world. But I must say I love the news because it's so exciting. <laughs> and it's different every day. You know? And then last but not least, freedom from having to be intoxicated. Can we be free from not being intoxicated? You know, pretty soon it'll be legal to smoke dope. Up and down. We got the pharmacy right down the street with the big green cross, you know. Buy your intoxication here. You will have a better day. You know? Wouldn't it be nice to be free from that? Think how much money you would save. Think how much clarity you would have. Think how much better the conversations would be when they're not clouded because of the delusion of intoxication. All these things are really important to start our road to freedom to start to be free from suffering. Now, one of the things I think that the Buddha talked about was getting into the flow. You know, in the book Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, they, they talked about the river and the flow, and, and we keep getting caught on the banks and the sticks and the rocks, and it causes us to suffer and be uncomfortable. And if we could stay in the middle of the flow, it would be perfect. But in order to stay in the middle of the flow, we have to sort of get rid of some of our ideas of how things are supposed to be some of our preferences, some of the ways we think life would be better. That stuff doesn't help us get into the flow. That stuff creates a, a necessity of clinging and pulling away, aversion and attachment. And so can we be in the flow of things? Can we see the world the way it really is? And the Buddha said, absolutely. And it will surprise you at how extraordinarily ordinary the world really is. Because all the other stuff is fake news. The stuff you learned in school. The stuff you see through the news media. 
the stuff you hear from your peer group telling you how you should be because they're that way and they want you to belong. All that stuff. So what do we have to do next? We've got to meditate. We've got we to cultivate our mind. We've got to clear out a lot of the old baggage that's been there forever and ever and ever. The way you define yourself and, and, and the way people define you. You've, you've got to let them define you in the way they feel comfortable, but you don't have to believe it. That's never been you and it never will be you. And every thought you've ever had about who you are, that wasn't it either. I think the idea is to really go through life saying to yourself, I don't know who I am. I know in this role as an employee or a husband or a wife or a man or a woman, I have certain ways I'm expected to think and act. But ultimately, if I want to be free, I have to transcend that stuff. I have to realize it's useful up to a point. It allows people to feel comfortable, but it's never able to define who you really are. So there you sit in meditation, waiting to find yourself, waiting for you to arise, exist, and pass away, over and over and over again. And yet, you never arise, you never exist, and you never pass away. Ego, personality, I, me, mine, arises all the time, exists all the time, passes away all the time. But who's behind that? Who's the real you? And if you're talking to a Hindu, they're going to say, the soul, man, the soul, that's who you really are. But if you're talking to a Buddhist, they're going to say, no, no, that doesn't really define it in a realistic way. Who you really are is, and then there's a silence. Then there's shunyata, emptiness, anatta, not self. And then you try to define that. And that doesn't work either. Nargajuna might have said, you are this, you aren't that. You are and aren't this at the same time. You're neither this or that at the same time. And of course, that level of philosophical thinking allows you to say, okay, what's left over is who I really am. But it can never be defined. There are no words to describe it. That's the freedom. That's the freedom. But we want even more freedom than that. We want even more freedom than not being able to identify or define who we are. We want more freedom than that. And the Buddha said, there's one more level you've got to go to to be really free. And he says, that's the level of nirvana. And when you finally achieve nirvana, you're free from suffering forever. You're free from self forever. Though it's not gone, it's not dead, it just doesn't define you any longer. And you're free from all future rebirths. You'll never have to do this again. And I know people really find it exciting to do life. Because life is full of possibilities, life is full of challenges. But you know what? Life is full of birth and death. And in between the birth and death, all you got is suffering. So maybe, with a realistic point of view, you're going to say to yourself, I don't want to do it even one more time. I have done it be ever since it didn't begin. See, we can't say ever since it began, because we don't have a beginning in Buddhism. We just have a big circle. So ever since it didn't begin, I was here. And it's not going to end, and I'll be here. And the only way to really end my suffering forever is to not be here, to be in nirvana, to be free. So freedom means a lot of things to a lot of people. It means getting out of school. It means leaving the family. It means getting your first job. It means corporate middle management. It means so many different things to so many different people. And yet, from a Buddhist perspective, it only means one thing. 
free from suffering. And we call that freedom nirvana, the ultimate freedom. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions or comments on freedom? Wow. Yes, I get you. I'll get Nicholas next. Yes, please. Thank you for your talk. I have a. So you talk about freedom, and it sounds like, a, like either we have it or we don't. And I'm wondering two things. You know, on the one hand, can, there, can we have degrees of freedom? Like I'm maybe a little freer today than I was yesterday. And at the same time, I'm wondering of the person who's very self aware. Right? And, and the freedom to do bad things, right? So maybe I'm not very self-aware, right? Um, so I do bad things, but I don't know that I'm causing suffering or that I'm, I'm making myself suffer because it's coming out of my greed, you know? But I, I do things, I get what I want, it makes me feel happy, and so, you know, subjectively, I feel like I'm free, right? Um, so I, I guess I'm just trying to get a wrap my mind around, you know, how we can have degrees of freedom and me somewhere in there, people still choose to do bad things and still get some kind of happiness out of that. Absolutely. And that's because of the greed, hatred, and delusion. But if you think you're free, you'll never not be a prisoner. If you think you're free, you'll never not be a prisoner. So that freedom that you think you have is an illusion that prevents you from being free. And that's sort of a bummer. So you're the first the first realization has to be, I'm not free. If you were free, you would have the choice of not to do bad things. But you say, well, I didn't even know they were bad, but they caused suffering. So you need to have a certain level of awareness in being a prisoner and a certain level of awareness of what it means to be skillful or unskillful, create more suffering or less suffering. And that's the first part of Buddhism. The first part of Buddhism tells you you need to wake up and you need to see where you are. And you need to see what you're new, doing through the prism of Buddhism, not through a social structure, not through what the government tells you or your city state leaders tell you, but what are the human values necessary to live in harmony and be in the flow? What are those values? So the analysis begins, and it takes a long time for people to find out where they are. And when I go up to Paulus Verdes and speak at a high school up there, they think life is great. They got a nice car, the football team is winning, the cheerleader is a girlfriend, they're just having a fun time. So I'm trying to say, well, no, it's, it's not the way you think it is. But I don't really want to dissolve their illusions at a high school level. Because that's a fun part of life, and it's good. And they're in the process of becoming somebody. But when somebody turns 30 or 40 or 50 and still thinks they're free, and still thinks what they do doesn't really hurt anybody because their intentions are good, well, then they need to focus on where those intentions come from and why do I think they're good. And, and from a Buddhist perspective, they would be good or skillful if they led to less suffering. So you can look around, and especially now, when you, when you hear the politicians speak, Sunday morning they always have the political uh, news programs. Are what they saying benefiting humankind by reducing suffering? Now, speech is one thing, action is another. But a lot of times they're creating fear because fear makes a great prisoner. I'm going to stay in my prison because it's safe here. And I'm not going to open the door and go out and try to be free because I won't be safe. You know, and it takes a long time to get past that hurdle. Once you do and you start looking around and you start using the five precepts as a reference point to being skillful, then you're making progress. And then you start to see freedom is not in what you do. Freedom is in what you don't do. And Buddhism is a path of renunciation. We keep giving up stuff in order to have perfection, in order to have freedom, in order to have happiness. 
And so in our process of giving up stuff, we start to see that if we give up killing or stealing or lying, our life is better. And the lives of those around us are better too. And on it goes. And then we start, in our meditation practice, giving up who we think we are. But we don't deny the fact that the self is there and important because it's a complicated world and we're the only animal walking the earth that has our kind of self, our kind of self-image. So it, it, it's really useful, but it doesn't make a good master because it's only concerned about one thing, us. And that's a very low level of existence. So we want to be concerned about them as well. And that's when self needs to be tweaked a bit. And it's tweaked in a really unique way. When you talk about emptiness in Buddhism, what you're saying is this, that the self is actually interconnected and interdependent with all the other selves in the universe. That it's never just about us when it comes to a spiritual path. It's about our relationship to everything. And that allows us a certain level of transcendence And that transcendence allows us to see the world in a very unique way, that we're all in this together. And if I succeed, everybody succeeds. If I fail, everybody fails. If I'm angry, everybody's angry. And and so we have a lot of things we can do at this level to make our life better and suffer less. And then ultimately, in nirvana, you know, the Buddha still had a personality, if you listen to him. And, And... And and so we don't ever lose our personality. We are always going to have characteristics, it seems to me, that we've had our whole life. But they may be a a, a little more rounded and softer edged. and, and, And people will say, well, he's still the same old guy. And and that would be correct in a, in a very real way. But also, he's a different guy because he doesn't react now. He responds to situations. And he might do it with his personality and the way he speaks. That doesn't change. But the response is going to be different because it's going to lead to less suffering, not more suffering. So the first thing you have to realize is you're a prisoner and you're not free. And that's when the work begins. So, yeah. <laughs> Nicholas. Yes, uh, um, I mean, you, you raise a lot of questions, but I'll try to keep it simple in my question to you. Um, I feel like in this world, things are so complicated that it's almost impossible to be ethical. And you talk about awareness and, and the good and bad causing the fact of things, you know, related to suffering. Um, but in this realm, one can't survive without causing suffering to something else or eating even as a source of, you know, feeding off of other living beings. Um, is this sense of um, nirvana possibly just its own illusion in this realm? Like, how can we truly end suffering in a suffering realm? Um, that's I've always struggled with this, and it's the big question I have with Buddhism, and uh, I still don't have the answer for that one, but it is yeah, I think it's an illusion to us because we're not there. So if you haven't been to New Zealand yet, it's an illusion. You've seen a map, a two-dimensional replication of where it might be, what it might look like from the sky. You've heard people speak funny and you've seen the sheep. And that has confirmed in your mind that it does exist. But and, until you're there, you really don't know. Until you're there, it's just faith you know, and a vivid imagination. And I think for all of us in this room, nirvana is probably that as well. Unless someone's there, but you're hiding it well. Now, does that mean it doesn't exist? Well, you know, we could say New Zealand does not exist, but we can get to New Zealand. They have airplanes that actually fly there, and we have a path that the Buddha described that allows us to fly to nirvana or get to nirvana. So we would say uh, the possibility exists. You know, at least I would say that. I'd say the possibility exists. We have documentation that some people, both men and women, have actually been there and stayed there. 
and have called back through their writings what they discovered and how it was. And we go, wow, we have the Terigata, you know, and the Teragata, the poems of the monks and the nuns from the time of the Buddha. And they, they wrote down, they spoke at first and written later, of, of their experience in nirvana. So I'd have to say, yeah, the, generally speaking, I, I have confidence that it does exist and that there is a path to get there. And the deciding factor is me. And so how am I doing on the path? Well, that's the part that is really hard to say because you're not in any real sense going to nirvana. You're already there. And your job is to wake up and realize that you're there. So how close are you to waking up? Hard to say. We don't know what the alarm clock is set for. This lifetime, next lifetime, four lifetimes. Yet we continue because if we don't continue, we, see in, we sense that the world is, is really a lot worse than it is. We get confused. We're not sure about our next step or our next choice. And if we have a, just a little daily meditation practice, it really helps with the clarity. It really allows us to feel much more comfortable on the path. So to your question, I would say, yeah, it seems like we have to be sort of um, unskillful in order to make a living, have a place to live. We need to seek our advantage over the advantage of others because that's what it's all about. And, and that's the first step. And then the second step is to see you really don't have to do that. It depends what you want. And a lot of people simply want a lot of paper with numbers on it, you know, dead presidents. They want, they want as many of those dead presidents as they can get. And, and that's their whole goal in life. And then you know what happens? They die. And you can have no dead presidents and live in a cottage in the forest, a kuti, and meditate and live in, with harmony in nature. And then you know what happens? You die. So, th so the deal is um, we choose what makes us feel important, special. We, we choose things that give us credibility, that help identify ourself as something special. And, and that seems to satisfy most needs for most people. But once in a while, you get somebody who says, no, I, I want more than that. I don't want to simply define myself by my bank account. I want to define myself by what I say and do. And in order to do that, I've got to change the way I think. And people oftentimes think that if they change their thinking, they will change their lifestyle. But somebody once said, if you really want to change your thinking, change your lifestyle first. And that lifestyle then will change your thinking. So it's a, it's a matter of adjusting and fine-tuning and never quite sure what's next. And then the mystery of life becomes something you live with and feel comfortable with every day. That there's no guarantee of tomorrow. I think we talked about that before. We just do what we do today and, and we wait and see the results. Karma, cause and consequence. And then we go on to the next thing. And then we die. So we're all here. It's going to be a hot and muggy day today. And we're going to make the best of it we can. And then on the 4th, we're going to celebrate the, the country. And, and most people like to uh, uh, cook dead meat and have a few drinks. Barbecue. We used to have somebody that lived here that always wanted to barbecue on the 4th of July. And they pull out the grill in front of the IBMC and have those big slabs of meat just barbecuing out there. And Reverend Shanti would go, ah, maybe barbecue is not the best thing for a Buddhist center. You know? <laughs> so however you want to celebrate, enjoy your day, and, and, and realize that you're not free until you achieve nirvana according to Buddhism. Thank you, Nicholas. <laughs>